Welcome to the second half of this presentation on the rotational dynamics of drill strings. If you haven't already watched the first half, you should, in order to get the most out of this part. In the first part, I showed you what rotational dynamics look like and covered the role of the bit in both generating and amplifying rotational waves. The second half covers the other topics, friction and attenuation, low frequency stick slip, start-up oscillations and BHA resonances. High frequency oscillations, also known as HFTO, will have to wait though for the third and fifth presentations. Since understanding the resonances means understanding the balance between amplification and attenuation, let's get on with what is known about the attenuation of rotational waves. I'm also going to talk about the attenuation of axial waves here, as some of the mechanisms are very similar. The main source of attenuation at high frequencies is viscous drag, drag of the steel motion relative to the fluid. Often, in numerical models, it is assumed that the drag is proportional to the average relative velocity of the steel and the fluid, and this is wrong. This error matters, as drag proportional to relative velocity will result in attenuation that is broadly flat with frequency, which is not what is observed. The drag depends on the rate of change of the shear gradient of the fluid at the steel surface, and this gradient is proportional to the square root of frequency. The consequence of this is that attenuation grows as the square root of frequency, and is why there are no high frequency resonances that extend all the way along the drill string. As you can see, the formulae for attenuation for axial and rotational waves in constant cross section tubulars are very similar. This is assuming fluid properties are the same in the annulus as inside the pipe, and the pipe is centered in the borehole. Though as the frequency increases, the centering assumption makes less and less difference. So at high frequencies, there is enough drag to stop resonant behavior, and only a small amount of the energy that will get to the surface for a long drill string. However, there is another important phenomenon. You may remember we saw high amplitude resonances rotating off bottom in a horizontal well. This is common. It can't be the bit doing the amplification, as the bit isn't cutting. So what is it? There is a lot of circumstantial evidence that it comes from the frictional interaction between the drill string and the borehole wall. Normal wall friction models are Coulomb. They assume that there is a constant friction coefficient once there is relative motion between the drill string and the wall, but a higher static friction coefficient to overcome to get the motion started. Once the drill string starts rotating off bottom, the torque required is not seen to vary with rotation speed, so this seems a good model. If you put this into mathematical models that include viscous damping as well, rotational oscillations that may start when the drill string starts rotating are damped down. If, however, you use a Strybeck model where the transition happens over a finite rotation speed range, then simulations show that the oscillations can continue indefinitely. There is laboratory experimental evidence for speed varying friction coefficients in the presence of drilling mud, although larger scale experiments were inconclusive. So is borehole Strybeck friction consistent with what is observed? The answer is yes. The Strybeck friction hypothesis is largely consistent with field observations of off-bottom stick slip. One prediction is that if you can get the drill string up to a high rotation speed fast enough at startup, then continuous stick slip can be eliminated, and this has definitely been seen. Also, the effect of making changes to the drill string structure and trajectory are very consistent with models. To illustrate this, I will go back to the horizontal well I showed earlier. The rotational oscillations become more damped and better behaved beyond a certain depth. This is a very odd observation. As more pipe is added, the drill string compliance also increases, and there is also more drill string wellbore contact, but the self-amplifying resonant behavior disappears. When I first modeled this, from the drill string information I was given, I could not reproduce this behavior. But then I noticed that the pipe size was incompatible with the surface torque. It would have broken. So I queried this and was told that the upper section of the drill string used thicker, heavier pipe. Remember that as the drill string gets longer, adding thicker pipe, it still gets more compliant, only more gradually. To my delight, as soon as I changed the model, with reasonable Strybeck friction parameter choices, 
a remarkably good correspondence between data and model appeared, and the transition from stick slip to damped vibrations was reproduced at about the right depth, exactly where obviously depended on the exact parameters used. So contrary to what we might intuitively think, does contact friction between the drawstring and the borehole not attenuate vibrations? Experimentally, both axial and rotational disturbances at high frequencies are strongly affected by borehole contact. The cutting action of a roller comb bit generates a huge amount of axial vibration. And in a vertical well, if you put accelerometers at the top of the drill string and drill with a roller comb bit, you can always detect a lot of axial vibration. This is sometimes made use of for what is called drill bit seismics, using the bit noise as a seismic source. However, if the well is deviated or horizontal, the noise quickly becomes undetectable above the background rig noise level. Similar observations have been made for rotational vibrations from PDC bits. Now Coulomb friction is not going to affect rotational propagating waves, as it only depends on the side force and not the velocity. There is a small effect on axial waves due to the change in the direction of the velocity of the steel, but this is much smaller than the attenuation that is observed. Once the drill string is moving sufficiently fast, the same is true for Strybeck friction. Trying to model the friction empirically, the simplest model is that it is proportional to side force and to velocity. Axial velocity for axial waves, rotational velocity for rotational waves. Many, many years ago, we did some experiments in a test well with a horizontal section, measuring axial and rotational vibrations at the surface from a roller comb bit. As with most test wells, it was relatively short, so we still got axial and rotational energy at the surface. Unfortunately, I can't show you the experimental spectra, so you'll have to take my word for it. But there was an exceptionally good match between the theory and data if a loss term was included that was proportional to both velocity and side force for both axial and rotational waves. Now, I've talked about the role of Strybeck friction in wellbore contact, but what about at the bit? Self-amplifying oscillations are often ascribed to Strybeck lake behaviour at the drill bit. Not friction necessarily as the bit is cutting rock, but a bit torque that reduces as the rotation speed increases. This is equivalent to the energy required to remove rock decreasing as the speed increases. In normal drilling, at the bit rotation speeds used, the surface torque is pretty much independent of rotation speed. At very low rotation speeds, this torque variation is experimentally observed. And so certainly, if the oscillations have already increased enough that the bit speed at times is zero or close to zero, it will contribute. But it does not explain how they can grow when the bit is in continuous fast rotation. However, as we have seen in the first part of this talk, Strybeck effects are not necessary for the bit to amplify oscillations. And importantly, drill string stick slip is seen both off bottom and in motor drilling with the drill string rotation speed going from zero to twice the mean, but the motor rotating steadily, and so the bit never getting close to stationary. Hence, my conclusion here. While Strybeck type effects may occur at the bit, PDC bits can excite rotational oscillations at all rotation speeds and without any Strybeck type behaviour. I should add at this point that strange things can happen, for which I don't know of any explanation. We had a data set recorded near the bit in a horizontal well, where the rotational oscillations were very repeatable. At the start of each stand of drilling, drill string rotation was initiated with the drill bit off bottom, and the drill string went straight into low frequency stick slip and stayed there. When the bit went on bottom, the stick slip vanished, and there was a low level of rotational oscillation up until when the bit was taken off bottom at the end of the stand, at which point stick slip reappeared until surface rotation ceased. This happens stand after stand. There is a small difference in side force when on and off bottom due to the differing axial force in the drill string, but not nearly enough to account for this. It certainly looked like the oscillations were excited by drill string wellbore contact and damped by the drilling action. And for this, I have no theoretical explanation. But to summarize the important lessons, a PDC bit amplifies rotational disturbances. Borehole contact can both excite rotational waves and damp them. High frequencies are damped both by viscous drag and 
borehole contact. That was about how rotational vibrations may be amplified or attenuated, but what do the resonant oscillations themselves actually look like? You've seen this before, and this kind of situation is very, very common. The rotation speed oscillating between zero and twice the mean at the fundamental resonance of the drill string. And this situation too is relatively common, maybe more so in deviated wells. This data is from running into hole, but you will often see something like this while drilling. Between two and six minutes, you can see flat periods. The drill string spend some time stationary before it gets moving again. And of course now, since the average has to be the same as the surface rotation speed, the peak rotation speeds are higher. The flat periods are not consistently long, so the oscillations are not quite periodic. So what are the low frequency modes? Well, the drill string normally has a controller trying to turn it at constant speed at the surface. So this is close to a fixed boundary condition. And you saw in the drill bit section that at the bit, the reflection coefficient is close to 1, and this corresponds to being free. If the drill string were constant cross-section all the way down, the fundamental would simply be one quarter of a wavelength, and the higher modes are odd numbers times the fundamental frequency. Equivalently, the periods are the period of the fundamental divided by an odd number. Because the BHA has a much greater moment of inertia per unit length than the pipe, the fundamental period is actually a bit longer than if it were constant cross-section. A good approximation is to multiply the BHA length by one half of the impedance ratio between the collars and the pipe, plus its inverse. You'll have to trust me on this, as it's a bit complicated to explain why. So for a 3000 meter drill string, the period will be greater than 4 seconds. For 6000 meters, greater than 8 seconds, so this is not a fast phenomenon by normal standards. If all you have is surface data, can you tell the difference between the situation where the drill string is not sticking and when it spends a while not moving? Most low frequency stick slip is at the fundamental, which is the quarter wavelength mode. If you just have the fundamental mode, or indeed if you have the fundamental mode with some higher modes but everything is linear, no sticking. If you look at the frequency spectrum of the surface torque data, you will see spikes spaced out roughly like the odd numbers. I showed you a spectrum like this earlier. Odd numbers, no even numbers. Once stuck periods develop, two things happen. The oscillations are more spread out in frequency, as the stuck periods are erratic, and the frequency will probably go down a bit due to these extra periods. But in addition, there will be signal at even multipliers of the fundamental frequency. If you have an oscillation which is symmetric about zero, i.e. you turn it upside down and it looks the same as the right way up, then it has no even harmonics. However, once there is a stuck period, this is no longer the case, so there will be even harmonics. This is a bit of an idealized view. Because of nonlinearities of the surface system, there may be a small amount of even harmonics even with no stuck periods. But if they suddenly grow in amplitude, this is a strong sign of stuck periods at the bottom of the drill string. I wasn't sure where to put this slide, but simply changing the drill string design can reduce the amount of rotational oscillation enormously. Putting it simpler, bigger, is better. For high angle wells, none of this may be possible. Bigger drill strings weigh more, so have more frictional torque, and this is the main consideration in drill string design. But for vertical or low angle wells, there is plenty of scope to modify the drill string. It is generally known that bigger drill pipe is better. 5 inch pipe is better than 4.5 inch, which is better than 4 inch, and 6 inch would be better than 5. The main effect here is simply that drilling the same rock with the same bit on a different drill string, the excitation will be similar, it's the same bit cutting the same rock, but the system response is reduced if it is stiffer. Also, if you need extra torque, because the bit has stopped, or because you've hit hard rock. The pipe has to turn less to absorb that extra torque. Something that is less well appreciated though is the role of the BHA. In an ideal world, there will be a rotating mass with a huge moment of inertia just above the bit, so that if the torque demand increased, the mass would just decelerate a tiny amount to generate the torque needed. Torque 
equals moment of inertia times rotational acceleration. Unfortunately, everything has to fit in the hole above the bit, but having as much moment of inertia as possible in the BHA still reduces the deceleration that torque changes generate. The role of drill collars in the BHA is normally thought of as to provide weight on bit, but they also stabilise the rotation of the bit. There are obviously other considerations in deciding on collar size, such as annular pressure drop and rig handling. But if you are in a big hole, say 12 and a quarter inch or above, don't just use eight and a half inch collars, use the biggest ones you can. Moment of inertia goes as radius to the fourth power, so even a small increase in outer diameter can make a substantial difference. I would really love to see what happens with really heavy collars, ones filled with tungsten powder have been proposed, but so far as I know, never used. Now, back to the low frequency resonances. It can be quite difficult to inhibit the initiation of stick-slip oscillations, but there is one situation where it can be done quite easily, and that's at startup, and the excitation comes not from the bit, but from the top drive. Let me show you what the problem is. Again, simulated data, I'm afraid. Here is some near-bit rotation speed, similar to that seen in a vertical well. Not very deep, as you can tell, because the period of the oscillations is two and a half seconds. When rotation is started from surface, the bit takes a very long time to get into steady rotation. It's off bottom and vertical, so there's nothing to excite the oscillations other than the startup and then a bit of movement at about 25 seconds. But the odd thing was that while at the start of drilling some stands there was a lot of oscillation, other times there wasn't. Same well, slightly different depth. And here, when rotation started, it went straight into steady rotation but when the speed was adjusted a bit, at about 45 seconds, some oscillations started, which took a while to damp down. Here is what can happen in a horizontal well, showing the surface rotation speed too. You can see that it's quite a long time after the surface rotation starts, before the bit rotation starts, and it just stays in quite erratic, high amplitude oscillations. What is going on here? First, a reminder of what happens when you excite a linear resonance system. The excitation contains a range of frequencies. The response of the system in the frequency domain is the excitation spectrum times the transfer function of the system. If the transfer function is very large at a few frequencies, the response will be dominated by the transfer function at those frequencies, multiplied by the amount of those frequencies in the excitation. However, if the frequencies aren't present in the excitation, then the resonances will not be excited. The excitation here is starting up the drill string, going from zero speed at one time to another constant speed at a later time. The excitation is flat before the ramp and flat after the ramp. It's the integral of a function which is non-negative and only non-zero for a finite period, which I'm calling C because it has compact support. Fourier theory tells us that the Fourier transform of the ramp S is I times the Fourier transform of C divided by the angular frequency omega. So, importantly, if C has a zero in its spectrum, S has a zero in the same place. Let's see what this means in practice, or at least in simulation. This is a simulation of starting the drill string rotating in a vertical well. The drill string goes from zero to 100 RPM in 1.15 seconds. You can see this in the top left. The model contains an extra feature, which is that it also simulates a top drive controller. So while the controller is asked to take the speed up to 100 RPM in 1.15 seconds at a constant acceleration, it doesn't quite manage it. What it actually does is shown in the bottom left. Pretty close, but not exact. Because there is very little loss, the bit rotation speed oscillates afterwards and it oscillates mainly at the fundamental frequency. In the bottom right, I have plotted the Fourier transform of the rate of change, the function in the bottom left. The red dashed line shows the frequency of the fundamental mode of the drill string. You can see that there is a notch in the spectrum, but it is not where the fundamental mode is. The notch is at a frequency of one divided by 1.15 seconds. 
The graphs here show what happens if we get the notch of the spectrum to line up with the fundamental frequency. For a linear ramp, that means the transition has to take the same time as the period of the resonance you want to avoid, or an integer multiple of it. I've plotted a 1.15 second startup, as well as a 2.3 second and a 4.6 second, which is the frequency of the fundamental mode. You can see that if you get the transition time right, the cyan line, the startup oscillations virtually vanish. What is important to note here is that it doesn't matter what the initial and final rotation speeds are. All that matters is the time it takes to make the transition. Going back to one of the examples, what I think is happening is that the initial startup was quite long and close to the period of the resonance. When the speed was changed later, it was done over a much shorter period and excited the resonance. I'm sorry you can't see the actual data showing this. So what's the rule for this? Firstly, you have to know what the period of the lowest frequency resonance is, which you can do by simulation or just by looking at the spectrum for your surface torque data. Then you change rotation speed over that period or an integer multiple of that period. Whatever the rotation speed change, you do it over an integer multiple of the period of the resonance. It doesn't matter if you don't get it exactly right, it just means there will be a bit of vibration. Now, that was all in a vertical well, but what about in a deviated well? Remember, this is the kind of thing you see. Let's repeat the simulation for the 4.6 second startup, comparing vertical and deviated. The surface rotation speeds look very similar for vertical and deviated, but the bit rotation speeds shown top right are very different. The vertical one suppresses the oscillation, the deviated one certainly does not. The other difference is the time to first movement down hole. For the vertical well, it is close to the acoustic travel time from surface to down hole, but for the deviated well it is much longer. In the bottom right I plotted the surface torque, and these are very different. For the vertical well, there is a burst of torque required to overcome the inertia of the drawstring, after which the torque needed to maintain rotation is very low. In the deviated case, there is a high average level needed because of the friction between the drawstring and the borehole wall. So what determines when the bit starts rotating? As I said just now, for a vertical well, it's the acoustic travel time. For a deviated well, to get the bit rotating, there has to be enough torque in the system to overcome all the borehole friction. But the drill string has rotational compliance, so the drill bit doesn't start rotating until the top of the drill string has turned enough. It has to at least have turned by an angle given by the total borehole frictional torque divided by the rotational compliance of the drill string. A bit of guided experimentation led to working out how to get a good startup in a deviated well. I apologise that this slide is rather busy, but I will take you through it. The blue line is the 4.2nd second startup that we saw earlier. Top right, you can see that it results in a lot of oscillation. The red line is what happens if you use a vibration control algorithm in the top drive. I'll talk a bit about these in the sixth presentation, but exactly how they work is not important right now. Just look at the shape of the startup that results. The algorithm was trying to follow a 4.6 second ramp while minimizing oscillation, but what resulted was a much longer startup that looks close to being a double ramp. The red line in the top right shows that it does a pretty good job of minimizing oscillations. The red line ramps up over 7.2 seconds, but if instead we use a constant slope ramp over 7.2 seconds, we still get a lot of oscillation. What works near perfectly is the black bilinear ramp, which, as you can see, involves a slow rate of change to start with until it hits the 4.6 second ramp, at which point it proceeds as in the vertical well. The reason this works is quite subtle. Friction is a very nonlinear phenomenon, but once the whole drill string is rotating, the system is completely linear, at least in the model. So, if you can get the whole drill string rotating at just the right time and speed, you can get the system into the same state that it would have been starting up in a vertical well, just with the extra torque in the system to overcome the borehole friction. This is how to calculate the ramps required. 
T1 is the startup time you will be using for the same drill string in a vertical well. I've told you it can be an integer multiple of the resonant period, but I'm assuming the multiplier is 1. Using a simulation, you need to measure the time lag between rotation starting at surface and the bit, then multiply by 2 to get a two-way time, T2. The rotation speed at which your initial slow ramp needs to hit the fast ramp is the ratio of T2 to T1 times the maximum rotation speed. When the rotation speed reaches that point, the drill string needs to have the borehole frictional torque in it. So the start time of the first ramp is twice the rotation angle required for this, which you can calculate from the drill string mechanical properties and the measured off-bottom rotating torque divided by the intersection rotation speed. One of the odd features of this is that it takes less time to start up to a high speed than to a low speed, as the length of that initial slow ramp is inversely proportional to the final rotation speed. That's because when you're rotating faster, it's quicker to get the torque you need into the drill string. Now, unfortunately, so far as I know, nobody has ever actually tried this out. And since our theories of borehole friction are not exact, it is unlikely to work perfectly but it should work a lot better than what is currently done. As I said above, the lower the final rotation speed you want, the longer the whole startup takes. You may be better off going straight to as fast as your top drive maximum power allows you, then slowing down. Once you're rotating, any changes you make, just make the transition using a linear ramp, just as in the vertical case, as your drill string now has all the extra torque in it that it needs. The system is now nearly linear. I should add here that the Strybeck effect, which I talked about earlier, but I'm ignoring in this analysis, are also reduced if you get the drill string rotating faster. You will need some additional numbers. The borehole frictional torque you can estimate from surface data. It's the off-bottom rotating torque, not the start-up torque, which will probably be higher to overcome static friction. The rotational compliance just needs a simple calculation based on the drill string geometry and the shear modulus of steel. Ideally, you want a full drill string simulation to get the lag time T2, but you can always make a guess and then adjust. It won't be more than half the period of the fundamental. In this example, it is at about 40% of the fundamental period. For anybody itching to get out onto a rig and try this, there is Schlumberger AIP on this, which depending on where you are in the world, may also apply. Check the patent families for these US patents. The obvious question to ask me at this point is whether this theory is used in any Schlumberger drilling optimization software, to which my answer is, not so far as I know, which is odd as the theory is about 10 years old now. But since engineering takes more notice of customers than of research, if there are any customers watching this, you can always ask them to put it in. A summary. If you are in a vertical or near vertical well, Startup ramps should be over the period of the fundamental resonance or an integer multiple of it. Similarly, if you change rotation speed or change weight on bit, also do it over the same time to avoid exciting the fundamental resonance. In a deviated well, startup should be a bilinear ramp, but once the system is fully rotating, changes in speed or weight on bit are just as in a vertical well. Finally, all this needs to be tested. We're nearly done, but before finishing, just a word about BHA resonances. That's these features here, due to vibration being partially trapped in the BHA due to the impedance transition between the BHA and the pipe. They appear at frequencies where the BHA length is roughly a multiple of half a wavelength. And for rotational oscillations, they can be quite strong as there is a high impedance contrast. Very occasionally, you can get stick slip at these frequencies, though it is uncommon. You don't have to have them though. If the impedance transition is gradual, the rotational energy is not trapped. Making the impedance transition gradual is surprisingly easy, as it doesn't require anything like tapered tubulars. Just that at the top of the BHA, you do not go straight from full-size drilling collars to pipe, but have collars intermediate between them in size between them. There is as with the startup, some IP on this, in US, Mexico and Europe, 
And just as with the startup, nobody has actually tried this. This is a simulation of the spectrum of the rotation speed near the bit for a 3,200 meter drill string with a normal BHA. The BHA resonances are a bit stronger than you would see in real data, but the bottom ones are not too different, and those are the ones you can concentrate on. The BHA here is about 200 meters long, constant cross section. On the right, you can see the effect of increasing the length of the BHA to about 260 meters. Total weight of the BHA is the same, so it is constant cross section for 160 meters, then 100 meters of transition, i.e. 10 sections of tubular, each of which are different. There's still one BHA resonance. If we make the impedance transition even more gradual, there are no BHA resonances. The BHA is now 306 meters long. Just as in the short transition, there are 10 different tubulars in the transition, except now there are two of each of them, so the transition is twice as long. This makes life a bit tricky for the rig crew when they're first making up the BHA, getting all the different colours in the right place and not missing a size out, but once they are made up into stands it should not be a problem. But it is really simple and obviously also cheap. It may not make a huge difference in drilling, but for the same drilling parameters it will reduce the amount of vibration at the bit, which is going to be a good thing. And it is very cheap. I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you if you're waiting to learn about HFTO, high frequency torsional resonances. They require a bit more theory and are in presentations 3 and 5. 3 for rotary ones and 5 for oscillations below motors. Finally, an overall summary. The rotational resonances of the drill string are both high and low frequencies. The low frequency ones are whole drill string resonances. The high frequency ones are localized to the BHA. The rotational system is always lightly damped and very often is self-excited. If you want to know more about mitigation, other than putting more metal in the hole, this will be discussed in the seventh presentation on control. A quick word of caution to finish. People often talk about reducing vibration, but that's not really what they mean. If drilling parameters are limited by the damage that vibration is doing to the bit and drilling tools, then mitigation will result in drilling faster, more weight on bit, higher rotation speed, while maintaining vibration at the highest acceptable level. Well, that was a long pair of presentations. I hope it has provided plenty to think about. We are not done with rotational vibrations, as we shall meet them again as part of the next presentation on periodic structures, which I'm sure you will be pleased to learn, is a lot shorter than this one. Questions, comments, etc. to the email on the bottom right.